All right, how's everybody doing? Fantastic. Luckily, we got the 1045 session, so maybe everybody's woke up by now, right? Uh, my name is Dylan McKenna. I'm Jimmy Tremonti. And uh, we are IT guys at a mid-major university in southwestern Pennsylvania. We're audibly close to a very large airport. And the best part about uh, the summertime is after you kick off a, uh, a lab or five to provision, right? There is a uh, Permani Brothers right next door. Go hit up the P bros and come back and just about everything's done, ready to go. Or, you know, you can see what you have to do next. Yeah. Um, so before we start, I figured I'd throw up the GitHub repo for, the, for our, our deal here. Um, so this is where you'll find our slides. Uh, you'll find an example of how we set lab computer names in Mac Labs. And you'll also find an example of how we are uh, packaging applications for Jamf Pro that come as .apps that you can't just throw into Jamf Admin. I figured I'd start with a little bit of tutorial on how to clone a Git repo. If this helps just one person in the room, I feel like it's worth it. So um, basically, you'll need to open up Terminal and change your directory to somewhere where you want to put that repo and then clone the repo. So I'm actually going to do this live for us here on my Mac just so we can kind of see what's going on. All right. Let's make that bigger. There we go, that's not too bad. Cool. So first thing on a Mac, if you open up your terminal and you type git, one of two things will happen. It'll tell you, okay, you wanted me to git something, but you didn't tell me what to do next. Or two, in my experience, if your Mac doesn't have git, it'll give you a nice little prompt that says, hey, let me download git and it'll download it for you, and then you'll be able to use it. So um, first thing you have to do is you have to change directory to somewhere where you want to put you know, your, uh, this, this repo, right? So you'll change your directory, and uh, that little tilde is signed. That means your home folder, and then you can start typing DES with a capital D and tab, and it will auto-populate to your desktop. You can make sure you're there by typing in print working directory, and uh, there you'll find that you are on your desktop, right? So that is how you know where you're going to put your git repo. And then the next thing, all you have to do is you have to just git clone and then that big long URL. GitHub.com. And then this one was called macadmins.git. And it will clone. And it'll probably take a second to clone, mostly because I put an actual copy of the little uh, CyberDuck app that uh, I'm going to show you how to package today in the repo. It's zipped up, but it's still kind of big. So it might take a second. I already have it on my computer, so I'm not going to let this do this. Um, but that is how you can clone a repo. And then once you have that there, wherever you clone that repo, you will have a folder and with all of the stuff in there. So like I said, in that folder is a copy of the slides, uh, a shell script of how we set computer lab names, and a folder with the application that we'll be packaging later. Cool. All right. It's always fun trying to figure out how the displays uh, worked out, right? There we go. All right. So that's that. Cool. So our deployment. Um, we have about 5,000 folks at our university between our undergrad, mostly undergrad, and a little bit of graduate. About half of them live on campus. Uh, 450 faculty and about the same number of staff. Um, for our deployment of Mac, we've got 138 Mac iMacs, most of which are in uh, Mac Labs, and MacBooks, about 83, most of which are MacBook Pros, and then there's a hodgepodge of other stuff, Mac minis and garbage cans and whatnot that are out there and uh, about 74 iOS devices uh, that are in our devices side of our Jamf Pro deployment. So where we were, uh, when I came to the university, we uh, were with a uh, Deploy Studio Monkey XServe shop, right? Something that you know, was put together by somebody that, that didn't work at the university by the time I got there. They, had a, they got a job at Apple, right? So cool. Uh, so I came in, and it worked. The system definitely worked, right? Uh, Deploy Studio Monkey, XServe, uh, you know, throwing down configuration profiles. Uh, it certainly worked, but you know, coming into that system and never really meeting the guy that had built it, it was kind of a head scratcher. Like, how does this work, right? So uh, the our director of enterprise infrastructure had used Jamf at a previous uh, job, so he had built the infrastructure for it. 
And uh, that's what we were, where we had it. We, you know, we kind of had it sitting there ready to go. So we decided that right after this conference last year, uh, we would really jump into it. The other problem with our previous deployment is DEP wasn't really a thing. And I remember coming to this uh, conference for the first time last year, and I was talking to Jimmy, and I said, ah, we don't need DEP. Yeah. And then by the end of the conference, I was like, I think we might need to look into school management. We were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we decided to uh, jump in the Jamf. Uh, we're currently on an on-premise instance at 10.12, right? Because I swear, Jamf waits for you to download the installer <laughs> from their website, and then three days later, they push out the update, right? So uh, we're at 10.12. I think they're sitting at 10.13 now. We've got two servers, Red Delicious and Golden Delicious, right? Apples, funny, right? Uh, so Red Delicious can be reached from the internet. So our Macs, whenever the Jamf agent decides to check in, uh, they can check in and we can see where they're at. Um, it's not all the way set up, so we can't quite deploy on the internet, right? You can't be not on an internal network and get all of those packages and configuration profiles that we'd like you to get, but you can check in from the internet. Golden Delicious is on the inside, and that guy is the where our database is housed, too. So you can't get to the database. Uh, from the internet as well. Um, our admin UI, right, the Jamf, whatever your UI uh, URL would be, you can reach that internally. And where you can reach it internally, uh, we've got an F5 load balancer and an iRoll that says, hey, like, you're only allowed to get this if you're on a trusted network. That way, a student can't sit in the lab and hit the admin you know, user interface of our Jamf instance. So provisioning, how the heck do we do it? Well, we uh, do all DEP, right? Even in labs and to employees. Every single thing starts with Apple School Manager. Uh, it was really easy to go from that old like dep.apple.com or whatever that URL was to School Manager. I think it was just a couple of clicks. Yep. And uh, there we were. We were in School Manager. Uh, it's really easy when you get in there. You know, you hit that uh, device assignments button on the left, and then you got to stick in a serial number assigned to server, and you set up that token between your Jamf instance and school manager, and then there it goes, right? There they start working together. Uh, recently, we've had to redo that token a couple of times for some unbeknownst reason, but uh, once you do, it seems to start working again. Nice thing is, is we just ordered a new Mac lab. Very exciting. We get to replace 2012 iMacs this coming summer with, you know, the new, uh, not Mac, iMac Pros, but the newest rendition of the regular iMac. Uh, so we'll be able to just throw in that order number into that school manager, and we'll get all, what is it, 17 or 18? Yeah. Yeah, the one lab there. Yeah. The real nice thing, too, is you can work with um, your cell phone provider vendors, like if you have Verizon or AT&T, and you could tie their system into yours. So whenever you make a purchase of a cellular iPad or an iPhone, it automatically dumps in there, and you just go and claim it whenever you receive the email from them. So those devices are supervised as well, since it's bought from Verizon or AT&T, and it can be claimed inside a school manager. Yep. So we can just throw in that serial number or that order number, and then there they go. Uh, recently, I noticed that Jamf Pro stopped giving you the refresh button under your, uh, your DEP or your pre-stage enrollments. Uh, now every five minutes it syncs. Uh, I don't know if that's something that'll stay there or if that's just me, but that seems to be what I've noticed. So we use pre-stage enrollments for everything, right? So once you get that thing in School Manager, or once you get that uh, phone, iPad, iMac, MacBook Pro, whatever, and you've assigned it to your server, you've got to get it into a pre-stage enrollment. Usually, right, most of the time, when a new Mac comes in, uh, it's going out to an employee, right? And maybe there's one or two MacBooks that come in, you know, a couple times a month. Uh, so we've set up Jamf Pro that as soon as you automatically, as soon as you put in a serial number into School Manager, and we've allowed our help desk uh, folks to be device administrators on School Manager, so all they can do is assign devices, um, it automatically dumps in to the Apple DEP employees, right? Because so what we've kind of realized with pre-stage enrollments with Jamf is that once something lands in a, in a pre-stage enrollment, that's sort of a variable that that device or computer record has associated with it that can't be changed. And so then you can set up smart groups and things like that to say, if this pre-stage enrollment is Apple DEP employees, then you're going to go and get this configuration profile, right? So that's sort of how we set up. So uh, pre-stage enrollments are a huge part. So generally, like I said, whenever you put a serial number in there, it automatically dumps itself into the employee's pre-stage enrollment. And then, you know, once every couple of years, whenever we get a 17 new IMAX, you just log into the UI and change that setting to make it dump automatically into the lab pre-stage enrollment. So then they all land there and then change it back before a help desk employee tries to, you know, provision a MacBook for an employee. So installing Mac OS, right? The next step is you got to install it. 
Well, one, we're about to get a whole new Mac lab, and we're not crazy enough to say, oh, I don't trust the OS that's coming with the Mac, so we'll just use the Mojave uh, install that comes on those. Um, but let's say we need to upgrade. So like today, at this very moment, our Mac labs are on High Sierra, and we've decided that for the fall of 2019, we'll go ahead and move everything to Mojave. So uh, internet recovery is going to be a big way to do it, right? So that'll get every, all those High Sierra, that'll get us, you know, just by a touch on the keyboard of each Mac, uh, that'll get us into that Mojave uh, recovery mode, right? Which we can use disk utility to wipe the disk, uh, and then we can run that Mojave installer. And that'll get, hopefully, all of our Macs from HFS Plus to APFS as well. Um, start OS install, right? That's good, but you know we like to use the erase install flag with start OS install whenever, especially we're provisioning a new machine, just to wipe out anything that might have been there that we don't want there, you know, to be here in the new deployment. Uh, but that only works, right, if the disk is already on APFS. What we've found, so uh, you got to get that disk over to APFS first, and then you can use start OS install, and you could launch that guy remotely via script that you have in Jamf Pro, right? So start OS install is a good method. And then, of course, uh, good for one-off machines, right? If you've got a Mac that rolls into the help desk and you, know, you need to rebuild it, um, you, we've got a couple flash drives sitting around that have the create OS install in order to make that a bootable installer. Uh, internet recovery works, works well there, too. So that's how we can get the, uh, the installer on the, uh, right, the install on the Mac and get it kicked off. Um, so like I said, we use uh, pre-stage enrollments for quite a bit of stuff. Um, and we've set those pre-stage enrollments to almost get rid of the entire setup assistant, right? I actually picked up in the packaging workshop the other day about perhaps suppressing the entire setup assistant. Uh, more work to be done there because remember there's a key part of the setup assistant where it says allow remote management, right? That's the third screen that you get whenever you, you know, have a Mac that goes through DEP. You've got to select its la language, select its country, and then if that Mac is appropriately able to get to the internet, it'll say, hey, you know, do you want to allow remote management? In our environment, once we click that button, it asks us for a time zone because we've hidden the location services uh, portion of the setup assistant, right? So the Mac needs to know what time it is. And then after that, it goes to the login screen. And all of our policies will start to run on that Mac. Um, policies add enrollment. So after we've hit that allow remote management, and uh, after we've selected that time zone, we get to the login screen of the Mac. And the Mac appears to just sit there, right? Um, but what we've set up in Jamf Pro is a whole bunch of policies that trigger at enrollment. And uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff there. And basically, what we've said is we've said, depending on what smart group you're in, right? Because now you have a computer record. And now that your computer record is tied to a pre-stage enrollment, we can say you land in a specific smart group. So we can set employees get certain policies at enrollment, whereas lab computers get other policies at enrollment. Most of that's for installing software, right? Because we don't need to put all of the software that happens in a lab on an employee MacBook. So again, once that computer record has landed in a smart group, it gets those at enrollment policies, and we're able to say which uh, pre-stage enrollment uh, computers get these policies and which ones get these policies. There's an example of what it looks like on our Jamf Pro instance. Add enrollment, um, please wait for Splash Buddy. Splash Buddy is a really cool thing. I'll bring that up in a second. Um, Sophos, that's our antivirus that we run through. And then their set computer uh, name. Uh, enrollment scripts actually has the set computer name script inside of it. Adobe Flash Player. And there's about 50 of these policies that run through, right? And every couple years, you run through and you just change what package, up, update what package is uh, actually associated with that policy to ensure a new deployment is getting your latest stuff. Uh, so there's an example. Uh, there's the Sophos package. All it has is just the one package associated with the policy. And it's, we have a category of at enrollment. And below that, if you were to scroll down, it would say trigger. And the checkbox for at enrollment would be there. Uh, and that's all there really is to it. And then the scope of the policy is where you want it to run, right? So like, which smart group would you like these to occur in? And so like for this one, every computer gets Sophos. So all of our, uh, all of our smart groups associated with every pre-stage enrollment is scoped to right there. And we could probably also just simplify that. If you really think about it, right, if we want every single computer, you could probably just use all managed clients in that scope too. It would probably work. Uh, but one of the things we've set up is first run smart groups. 
And the reason we did this is for a couple of reasons. Um, so when a machine gets in there, it says, okay, I'm gonna be in this first run smart group based on its pre-stage enrollment and whether or not it has ran its last at enrollment policy. So there are a whole bunch of policies, right? And whether or not it's ran its last one is whether or not it's still in this first run smart group. We did that for a couple of reasons. If enrollment doesn't go well, right, you can use Jamf enroll. I was chasing this little like thing last year uh, where you would get a different enroll return code with Jamf, right? It would say enroll return code zero. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a good enroll return code. And then occasionally I'd get like a 72 or a 71. And I was like, well, why the heck is it not zero? And it'd say I could never have figured it out. Um, so what I decided to do is use Jamf enroll on the Jamf agent until I got that zero. I wasn't sure what effects it would have if it wasn't enroll return code zero. But the reason I set these first run smart groups up is I didn't want it to try to then go and install all the software again whenever it was enrolled, because it was already there. Most of the software made it, if not all of it. It was just that enroll return code that made me nervous. So I set up that first run smart group. So if it made it through all those at enrollment policies, it would leave that first run smart group, and then I could enroll the Mac again, but it wouldn't run through those policies again, right? So I didn't want it to try to install all that software again. The other nice thing is, is you can set the little email notification in Jamf that says when I enter and leave that smart group, so you know, oh, that computer is done imaging or done provisioning. Uh, it's out of the first run smart group, and you get a nice email that tells you that. Um, so the other nice thing is uh, in, in the pre-stage enrollment, we've set up you know, the JSS admin account, and that's the, guy, that's the account right, that Jamf uses to go in and do its stuff. Um, and then we also set up another management account on our lab machines just so we can get into them if we ever need to. The nice thing is, is after um, you set up that extra account, after you've hit that allow remote management and allowed that or selected that time zone, you can log into that account and we've set up a nice little GUI for our help desk employees that shows right all the different things. And I got this last year from a, uh, from a session from one of the Jamf guys showing uh, like some Jamf marketplace stuff. This is really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Takes a bit of setup, um, but it's, it's really neat. It basically uh, it parses the Jamf log to give you a nice GUI of you know, where your policies are at. Um, it's really good for, for our help desk employees that like to see what's going on. Uh, the rest of us can just tail the Jamf log to see where we're at in that at enrollment policies. Alrighty, setting the computer name. So how we set the computer name in labs is uh, we maintain a CSV file out on our uh, web server, right? And uh, that CSV file just contains the serial number and what we'd like that name to be. So anytime we reprovision a lab computer, uh, anytime we provision any computer, right, it, there's a script that runs that says, hey, uh, all right, I'm going to go download that CSV file, and if my serial number is in that CSV file, then I'm going to name my host name this, right? And we just use the Jamf set computer name in order to do that. It works pretty well. Uh, and if that serial number is not in there, our host name structure is we like to stick the model identifier and then the serial number. So example, a MacBook Pro is MBP and then serial number. A MacBook Air is MBA and then serial number. An iMac is Mac and then serial number. So there's just some logic in there to go grab the model identifier from the machine itself and then just some if-else statements to say, OK, if you're a MacBook Pro, you get MBP and there's your serial number. And then we use that jump set computer name uh, to, again, set that. And that script on that GitHub repo is a, is a good example of how we do it. Don't yell at me for grepping inside of a shell script. What works, what works, right? <laughs> so that's how we do that. And uh, like I said, serial number and then the name of the computer. Um, so I mean, really, for our deployment of 100-something Mac labs, it's not incredibly hard to maintain. You know, We get one new Mac lab every couple of years. Just roll into that CSV file and change out those names. You know, and then it just sits out there and it works. Packaging an app. So some apps come off the internet in the form of DMGs with just a dot app in them, right? And you can't really do anything with that in Jamf Pro. Um, so others come with zipped up dot app files like Cyberduck, which is the one that is on that uh, GitHub repo if you want to look at that. Um, and so how do we do it? And then we can also use auto package where recipes exist to try to get uh, packages that you can throw into Jamf admin and work. So what we like to do is maintain a directory sort of in Git uh, for each one of the apps that we deploy. So if it comes off the internet as a dot app, Cyberduck, our media uh, arts professors really like to use that to show kids how to FTP uh, their web server files or their HTML files to their web server when they're learning about HTML and CSS and whatnot. But it comes off the internet as a dot app, so how do we do it? 
Like I said, we maintain these directories, and I have a directory, build cyberduck, and in it is two things, dot app, and then a shell script, right, that is gonna package that up. So that's what the shell script looks like. Basically, all it does is it moves the, um, or has the current path, right, of wherever you are running this directory. So you can move this directory wherever you want on your computer. Um, you have a bundle ID. The nice thing about maintaining this is like that bundle ID uh, remains consistent as every year uh, you know, comes through. So that way when you upgrade the application, if you need to upgrade it without uninstalling the whole thing, uh, you know, the installer can use that same bundle ID. It already exists. And so that way whenever a new package comes in, if any packages were deleted uh, or any parts of that package were deleted, the installer takes care of that for you. It's important to maintain the consistency of that bundle ID throughout your deployment. Change the version number. Of course, there's a way to maybe have uh, you know, defaults or something like that go into you know, the Cyberduck app itself, look at the plist, figure out what the CF bundle short version string is, and then put it in there for you. Um, but defaults doesn't usually like pr uh, just information plists. Defaults really likes more of like preference plists. So defaults doesn't work for Cyberduck. I'm sure there's a way to do it. Um, but you can just change it in there for, you know, that's a quick one line change in your deal. And then you can, of course, sign your deal there for your developer ID if you've got one of those. Um, doesn't really matter. Jamf will, of course, run that package whether it's signed or not, but it's a nice thing to do. Uh, and then there you go. So there's your PKG build at the end of it, right? So I don't rewrite this for every app. It's the same script for every app, right? Uh, but I maintain that directory that has one for each, each application. Open that directory, throw the new dot app in there, maybe open up the script and change the version number, and then I'm ready to go. Um, change my open terminal, change directory to wherever I put that thing. Make the script executable if it's not, right? So you might have to change the mode to that script to make sure you can run it. And then run the script, dot slash build cyberdoc.sh. And when you're done, magic, cyberdoc-7.0.1 is in that directory. And you can drag that into Jamf admin, and there you go. There's your package. To bind or not to bind? Uh, we bind. Um, and the m one major reason we bind is it gives you an SSO type experience in our Mac labs, right? So they can come in and they type in their username and their password, just like if they were, you know, their, uh, in their our, like, web server or something like that, or our website. Uh, we use that same thing so that we can um, DFS namespace mapping. So we've got DFS namespacing for our user profiles and for our submit network drive and our passouts network drive. Uh, and Kerberos Tickets takes care of that for us. And the other reason that we bind is that AD doesn't set, uh, does not lock accounts. So we've got like a, a homebrewed side deal over here. Uh, and that's how students log in and they check their uh, financial aid status and get their grades and register for classes. And it runs off of an Oracle database. And at the moment, in our environment, it's that Oracle database that's telling AD, hey, every 60 days, don't lock that account. Just go scramble that password. So then they don't know the password, and they got to go to our website, and they got to reset it. We're working on changing that to make AD more of like, you know, the password keeper, if you will. But today, it's not the case. So we bind to Active Directory. Uh, some of those things, like Enterprise Connect, right, they look, for that, they look for that account to be locked. Also, if you have an Enterprise Connect or a Nomad type situation, and then a user were to just change their AD password, well, that's great. They might think they just changed all their passwords, but now they go to our website to check their grades, and their password's still what it was. Right, so it doesn't work for our environment to, to have the Mac be able to change the AD password. In our environment, we still need to have our, our web service over here where you do a lot of functions for our university. You know, that's gotta be what, what changes, well, that's gotta be where you change your password. Lab configuration profiles. So we set a lot of configuration profiles, obviously, for each of our labs. Um, and for each payload for our labs, right, we set a network payload, and that gives a supplicant for Cisco ICE, which we'll get to in a second, which can be a pain in the butt, but it works. Uh, restrictions, we disable app installation. All of our uh, students in our Mac labs are standard users. They're not administrators. Um, so we disable app installation via a payload in a, in a lab configuration profile. We use the login window to set a little disclaimer that says, hey, be nice when you're on the Mac. Uh, mobility deletes the user profile as soon as possible, right? So we used to use uh, Pharonix Deep Freeze. Uh, we use it in all of our Windows labs, and we used to use it in our Macs. Um, 
The one big issue with that is we've got a, most of our Mac labs are for media arts students, right? So they might be sitting in the homework lab from you know ten to three in the morning, working on you know their project the day before the finals do, right? And if the power <laughs> goes out, which you know that can happen, especially on our campus, yeah. uh, DFE will um, instantly take that disk back to its previous state. The nice thing about setting this mobility in the lab configuration profile is when that computer boots back up, chances are the Mac hasn't had time to delete their user profile yet. So when they log back in, their work is still there in a usable state. Uh, and that was a big complaint with using DFE. Uh, not that power is a huge deal, but you know, even restarting the Mac or whatever, uh, they lose all of their work. As soon as possible, we found that after that Mac sits idle for a few minutes, mm -hmm. It'll go ahead and remove that user profile. So if the student's done working, uh, whatever they were doing, they get up, they walk away. The Mac will take a second. It'll remove that user. It'll remove that home directory. So anything they did is uh, basically gone. Security and privacy. We enable the firewall to prevent incoming connections. Uh, we schedule a startup time for Energy Saver, right? So that way in the morning, uh, what we like to do is make sure all of our Macs are checking in and ready to go in the morning. So that energy saver payload says, hey, go ahead and turn on every morning at 6 in the morning. So by the time students come in at 7, everything's ready to go. Uh, we've got a custom setting. I don't know if this is still a problem in Mojave, but it was for High Sierra for us, where you log in as a mobile user and you'd get the, hey, secure token, and sign as an admin username and password, right? Um, that custom setting for setting that, that ask for secure token auth bypass equals true gets rid of that for us. Um, and then Finder enables desktop icons for drives. That way when a student plugs in their flash drive, shows up on the desktop, that's always handy. And then uh, approved kernel extensions, uh, we've got a few of those running around in there, especially for things like Avid Pro Tools, right? So those weird software packages that have weird drivers, uh, we add the approved kernel extension, mostly for during installation, right? If you were to install a package and it needs a kernel extension, you get that dialog that says, hey, am I allowed to put that kernel extension in there? Uh, the nice thing about putting it in the config profile is that kernel extension is already there, so even if it does ask for it, it doesn't matter. It's already in that table. Provisioning rogue devices. Who has like folks that are in a DEP environment, but then somebody goes out to Best Buy and buys a MacBook? <laughs> All right, cool. So it happens to some of us. We're not the only yes. ones. <laughs> uh, how do we deal with that? So devices not purchased from your Apple representative today, I mean, I don't know how to get them to DEP. If you do, tell me, please. Yeah. Um, so you can't get them into school manager. You can't assign them a pre-stage enrollment. Um, so what we do is we take that device and we visit our jamfinstance.com slash enroll. And then we sign in with a user account that we've created that puts that, uh, sort of gives that computer a, a direction to go. So we know that that computer uh, is going to be enrolled by a user that we call enroller. And also what we do is we go into a smart group beforehand and we add the serial number to this smart group, right? So then we know as soon as that computer record comes in, it ends up in this smart group. Uh, two good reasons for doing that. One, we always have a group of computers we know are rogue out there that we had to enroll in this fancy way. And two, it gives you that pre-stage enrollments whenever it's go, or not pre-stage enrollments, but it gives you those at enrollment policies. Mm -hmm. We can scope an at enrollment policy to say, hey, if you land in this basic enrollment with AD binding smart group, that's just a fancy name for it because we bound it to AD as well, right? then we know what at enrollment policies to give you. And we did it a little bit differently because some of our rogue devices, you know, we didn't want to go ahead and install a whole bunch of software that we would normally give an employee. Um, we just wanted them to have a few things, Sophos, AD binding. So we gave them their own smart group so we can control what at enrollment policies they get once they're enrolled. All right. Has anyone heard of Cisco ICE, Identity Services Engine? You guys use it? A couple? So we rolled this out. Uh, it's been like a two-year project, but the heavy weight of it has been like the past like year. And it, uh, it's very nice because basically all the switch ports are configured the same way. You have um, a transient VLAN where everything hits first and identifies who you are, and it dumps you down into like where you're supposed to go. OK, you're an authorized printer. You're a staff Mac, staff Windows machine versus you're a, someone's personal device. I don't know what, what you are, and I can't trust you, so you're going over here, and you guys can get internet access, and that's about it. So this can cause some problems with uh, imaging computers, Windows or Macs, uh, based on how the timers are set. So in our environment, we have it set pretty low, um, kind of little thing we found from troubleshooting. It, uh, 
first tries for six seconds to identify who you are. Then after a six second timer kicks out, it waits one second and then it tries again for another six seconds. So kind of the secret sauce is the 15 seconds is whenever the Mac bypass list hits. So whenever we get new lab machines, um, they all have to be added to a, a, this bypass list. We call it a Mab list. So we add them in there, say in the description, here's the host name, here's the MAC address. Because the supplicant for the network card is not active at that point in time because it can't verify who you are against Active Directory to say, oh yeah, you're an authorized computer, I know your host name, and there you go, you get into this VLAN and you're allowed to do whatever you want internal on our network. So that prevents internet recovery. So like what Dylan was saying there, it's, it's sitting on that screen. Uh, we do like the four things there. You just let it, we just let it wait a few seconds and then the 15 second timer kicks in and then you have internet recovery access. So the other thing we ran into lately is the Adobe shared device licensing since Adobe changed that. We used to do the serialized based packages and uh, that's basically done after like August of this year is what my reps told me. So all of it is basically single sign-on. We set up the user sync tool, UST from Adobe, on a server that has internet access. It looks at specific Active Directory groups where all of our users are, takes that and synchronizes it out to their cloud infrastructure there assigns the licensing automatically based on who you are, if you're in a student group, if you're an employee group, and gives you access to those applications. So whenever you log into the software on a lab machine, or if it's an employee logging into their staff machine or their personal machine based on what licensing agreement you obtained with Adobe, it grants them that licensing. And then uh, another thing we, have come to do with is printing with Mac. So we use uh, Pharos on all of our stuff, Windows and Mac. The pop-up client for Macs are installed through Jamf. And ha we have a lot of Xerox printers and primarily the non-departmental printers or HPs. There are a couple like brothers here and there, but those are kind of dying off. So the Jamf policies we have custom PPD files for printers that have like fiery controllers and they have like advanced paper trays and the printers like as long as these tables and, and this big room and stuff. And those get loaded in there so you have all the settings. And then um, the other labs that have like the standard Xerox printer, those also get loaded in, have the you know tray three, four, five, six, whatever, the double sided, stapling, collating, all that stuff. Um, in the student labs, they can actually add printers through self-service if they want to print to like another lab printer like down the hall or another building on campus, wherever you want. Um, employees also have that same option as well. So they can pick basically whatever printer they want on campus, it installs, it comes up and says, oh, congratulations, you got the printer now. So now I can go kill more trees. So um, one way we've kind of laid down the PPD files is, is creating disk images and also include the Ferris pop-up package in there because of the timing of how you have to have that match up so it gets the settings. Um, we have printing available. It, we call it Wi-Fi print across campus. So you can also install this on your personal Macs or Windows computers. And it just keys off of whatever username you type into the box and authenticate with. And in this screenshot here, you would click the advanced icon to get into the larger dialog that would have, like, you select the Pharos. At least we don't have that screenshot. But there's a whole bunch of things there, like the SMB connection, the Pharos connection. And you start to fill it all out. And the average user has no idea what you're doing. And then we usually hop on, like, Team Viewer and do this and that. So we just build the packages, publish them on our website and anybody can grab them for 32-bit, 64-bit windows, or the Mac page has all the stuff to there across campus. Yeah, so the Pharos pop-up has a post install that we add, right? We just add a post install to SH, and uh, we bundle that with a, the actual Xerox print driver. 
So they hit the pop-up, right, dot package from Pharos, and then it goes out and says, okay, uh, I installed Pharos, let me run this post install script. And that post install script will uh, get the driver that's already in the package, install it, and then LP admin will put that PPD file in the right spot. And that's basically how we add printers for uh, students and you know whoever's coming in with their, their Macs from home. Uh, I figured I'd throw in this there. So uh, has anybody ever had problems with Kex policy identification? Uh, yeah, if you've got a weird driver or whatnot or some weird piece of software, our big one's Sophos, because yeah. Sophos needs to add a Kex policy, right? So if you try to install Sophos via a package, uh, you may or may not get the dialog, right, that says, oh, should I add this Kex policy? Um, and if you don't get that dialog, and if you get the dialog and don't hit yes, then that policy won't end up in the Kex table. Um, so one way you can identify them is this is here. Uh, the change directory into vardb system policy configuration, and then look at the Kex policy SQLite table, select everything from Kex policy table, and then it'll tell you uh, everything that you need for your Jamf configuration profile. Right? So you need that display name, that team ID, and the kernel extension bundle ID. Um, so that's, that's how you can get that if anybody ever runs into that situation. So you know, SQLite, look at that table, and, uh, and then there it is. There's everything. If, so basically, install the software correctly on your Mac, hit yes on the dialog, and then go look, uh, go look at that, that table, and you'll get the information you need for that configuration profile payload. Uh, iOS provisioning. So again, we, uh, re so the first thing you got to do, do is, you know, we'll get that, that iPad that comes in, and uh, it is either, you know, from old, because somebody found it in a drawer, or the employee left, right, something like yep. that. Uh, so first you got to restore the thing in, uh, well, first you got to claim it in Apple School Manager, right? So go to Apple School Manager, and, and, and we're actually kind of in a transition between Cisco and Meraki, and then moving all of our iOS to Jamf Pro. Um, so we'll go into School Manager, we'll claim that serial number, and we'll assign it to Server Jamf Pro. Uh, we'll assign it a pre-staged enrollment. Uh, most of our iPads and whatnot go out to employees, right? So we will have it so it automatically lands into the correct pre-staged en enrollment for us. Get the device into restore mode, plug it into iTunes, and reinstall the iOS. Uh, and then usually, right, you got it's an activation lock from an old employee. So you have to call Apple, fill out the form, wait four days, and then the activation lock's gone. Uh, has anybody had to do that? Yep. That's far less people. How are you guys dealing with activation lock? Please yeah. tell me after this, <laughs> after this presentation. Yeah. Um, so restore the iOS. And then, like I said, we uh, will leverage heavily pre-stage enrollments for our devices, right? And that helps us give different profiles. And not only different profiles, but different applications, right? Because right, once, a, once, an, I, once an iOS device lands in that pre-stage enrollment, it has that variable that's tied to it that can't be changed. And that allows us to scope our different uh, applications that need to be automatically installed into their, uh, onto those iPads. So if an iPad lands into School of Education and Social Sciences, uh, enrollment, right? And I know that this set of iPads needs these, you know, these apps. I use that smart group, and then those apps. It's a really easy deal. Uh, that iPad turns on. It skips most of that setup assistant because of that pre-staged enrollment. Mm -hmm. It gets whatever configuration profile it needs. It gets any Wi-Fi settings it needs because we have all of our shared devices automatically connect to our Wi-Fi, and then it automatically downloads any of those applications. So making a, when we just got, uh, our facilities just had like 40 something iPads come in, uh, it was just a couple of minutes per iPad. We've also found it's also easier in our particular environment, right? Rather than type in credentials uh, to our, you know, our secure network or our guest network takes you to a captive portal, uh, that's tough to do when you're setting up an iPad. So we just use a hotspot, honestly, to get out to the internet, let the iPad get its initial configuration. And that initial configuration includes Wi Fi connection settings then connect it to our Wi-Fi, and then it quickly installs all those applications, put it back in the box, hand it to the user. Our wireless also is part of that Cisco A system. So it profiles mobile devices the same way it does lab machines and staff machines. So if it doesn't like know that there's a tie between Jamf and ICE to be a trusted device, it's, it's bring your own device, and you get dumped over here as well. So that captive portal and stuff. And actually, a good way to get a free lunch, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So with ICE, there may be a situation in the cafeteria with a cash register where it got quarantined. 
and you go over there and you turn it back on with your cell phone, you get a free lunch. <laughs> Try it out, you guys have ice, it might work if you guys know the cafeteria staff. The best part about education is food service, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's basically it, guys, that's all we have. The, the other real quick note on that topic is the other problem with ice and getting dumped over here, right, is you can't reach our database, you can't reach our distro point for Jamf. So that's why we got to get uh, your, you got to get that Mac or whatever it is onto an internal network that can get to our distro point so we can download the packages we want. We got one back there. Hold on a second. We're going to get that, we're going to throw a box yeah, at you. Yeah, we'll get you that catch box so it's in there, yeah. <laughs> can you guys go over what you're doing for Adobe Shared Licenses? Again, you mentioned the license server that you're reaching out to. Yeah, so uh, Adobe has some really nice documentation of um, how to set that up. Basically, you have to have a server that has internet access because you'll be synchronizing um, your users and some other metadata about it. Um, we, there's like two or three different levels of how much data gets sent. We just send the username, the email address, and that's about it. You can have it synchronize passwords, but since we have SSO in place, we didn't want to store any of that in the cloud there for obvious security reasons. But basically, you set up, um, it's a bunch of like private and public keys. You do a little handshake there. Um, it uses Python. They're, they have, a, I think it's like Python 2 or 3. Um, and they like, tell you how to like set up the directories. Basically, there's like three or four directories, a bunch of Python files in there, and then some other files and whatnot. It runs, I believe it's set every hour or every half an hour, something like that. We have it set to look at it an Active Directory group called Current Students, which gets updated every so often with who's actively enrolled, so they get proper licensing. The employees group, that's way easier because we know who they are. So that group, it notices there's a change, it synchronizes it up there, automatically applies a smart label group that says like SSO licensing I've set up, and then you, you're authenticated and you're good to go. So whenever you launch the Adobe software, um, on Windows it's a little bit more streamlined because it knows that you're in Active Directory and you're logged into the computer. The Mac pops up a, a little like modified browser window, it redirects to our SSO page, asks you for your credentials, it comes back and gives you basically advance on to the next one or you type something wrong. That closes, then the Adobe app opens up and then you can use whatever Adobe product that you want to use. Um, when it was all said and done, it took probably like three to four hours to set it up. Uh, a lot of the majority of the time doing that was actually figuring out the firewall rules. We don't, it's basically in some degree like Fort Knox. We deny all in, deny all out. So we had to figure out what that was. Um, it, surely if you have questions and problems setting it up, just hit me up. Um, we found out how to get their like exact addresses because they didn't have all of them published. So the majority of them were, but they like didn't even know what they were. <laughs> so it happens. Um, so we're in a situation where we had some computers that were upgraded or up physically updated, right? Um, to the newer models and the teachers were on like 10, 11 or 10, 12. And then when we internet recovery, that's all that pops up, no Mojave. So have you run into that and how have you gotten around that besides hooking up a USB and then installing? So the hardware is upgraded but they want an older OS or are they? No, so like I'm wiping the old machine yeah. and when I internet recovery, even with that command. It's, it's, it's the OS still, that kind of came with it. Like, yeah. Or kind of in a way like yeah. for that platform and not the latest. Yeah. I think this guy's got a good answer. Command option shift R, I believe it is. If you just do command R, that's going to boot to the recovery that's on the machine. If you do command option shift R, it'll yeah. boot to the recovery that has the latest uh, available OS. Yeah, it still does it then. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh. I believe uh, internet recovery will only go to the latest OS that Apple says is like is approved, is a, like supported on that. Um, and it'll work. I don't know. I think I plug in the USB. 
<laughs> That's usually how I've gone around it. We don't use internet recovery too often, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's a, we're a small deployment, so you know, a MacBook comes into the help desk. You know, slide that thing in there, and that'll give you the. That's the fastest way to get to the recovery. That, that's usually what we do. So, like we last year we did uh, 1013 HFS, mm -hmm. so we can't leverage the erase install. Mm -hmm. um, that was me like pushing it off, and now it's like I have to do it. Yeah. yeah. So, when have you had a situation that you have to do 30 computers at a time, like in a lab? Do you? All internet recovery off all of them at the same time. Do you do them in batches? Are you using USB sticks? How do you? Do well, to be honest, on Monday I'll find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, when the new you yeah. know my my plan is to like as our big thing with ICE is right internet recovery will give up uh, because it'll say oh I have an IP address right? but I can't get to the internet so that's our first issue so once we get past that um, yeah my plan is to use the latest OS that that key combination to get to the latest OS. Uh, hopefully on internet recovery of Mojave. Uh, if that doesn't work, my plan would then do use start OS install without the erase install flag, right? So it will go to Mojave. The Mojave installer will upgrade the disk to APFS during the install and then redo start OS install with the erase install flag. So it's a double process, right? You basically have to install the operating system twice, but by the end of that, you should have a Mojave computer with an erase disk. So start OS install without the erase install will take an HFS plus, install Mojave, the Mojave installer hopefully upgrades to APFS, and then start OS install again with erase install, and then there you go. So and crazy then, plan, but. Yeah, and then like my other one was that I'm, this is just my internal struggles, right, is, all right, let's say I do start 20 machines, will caching server only serve 10 of them, and then the other 10 go out to the internet and kill our network connection briefly, you know, like stuff like that. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so what I have done is taken the package, uh, packaged up the OS, the Mac OS installer, and laid it down into the applications folder, and then have a uh, shell script that goes and calls the installer that's there, right? So have a package, lay that down first, so the installer is chilling in applications, then run your shell script with whatever start OS install you want. So it's not going to the internet for the OS. Yeah, so like push it out through like Jamf or something else so it lives right. there first. Yeah. So it's on your network and not your network connection. But you might still be limited by your uplinks in your building. Yeah, so depending on, yeah, like you said, in order, it's really up to your distro point at that point in a Jamf yeah. instance, right? Can, can it, will it lay, take that six gig installer or whatever and you know, give it to all 30 computers in a reasonable amount of time? We found with our network it does. Um, but, you know, I'd say if we were to do three labs at a time, we'd probably run into issues. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because you, you're right in the backbone of the internet. We, we belong to a consortium and have, like, an advanced connection and, like, Netflix and other services are cached, so it's never rendering and whatnot. It doesn't hit our bandwidth, but it, it all depends on, like, where your switches are in the building at that point. Yeah, but like I said, uh, do it locally. Put the installer on the disk and then let start OS install use that. Right next to you there. I had a real quick question. First of all, thanks for putting everything up. Really easy to get. A lot of times it's not easy to find the stuff you guys are talking about in your GitHub, so thanks for doing that. I had a really quick question about your PKG shell script. Right yeah. Me up. Did you say you need a developer ID to run that? No, you do not. Okay. Uh, you, would, uh, if, uh, you would have to, let's see, let's go back to this guy. If you didn't have a developer cert in your keychain, where are we at? You would have to get rid of the sign in the packed PKG build, right? You'd have to get rid of that first line that says sign, and then you'd have to get rid or comment out the developer ID line, right? So right now, if I were to run that script, the first thing it would say is uh, it would try to get to PKG build, and it would say, uh, you don't have a developer certificate called your name. So that would be the first problem. Um, so I'd comment out, uh, just get rid of that sign line, and then that package would... Uh, that and then Jamf doesn't care if it's signed or not. Jamf does not care whether it's signed or not, yep. Mm -hmm. All the way in the yeah, back. If you're using Jam, your prepaid, if your power extension approval period is in prepaid, so there's make sure it's in the config before the policy. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I think for us they're in the config profile, which would come down as soon as the uh, thing's enrolled. Yeah. So that would, yeah, but yeah, make sure that text policy is in there first. It'll, yeah, it'll get you past that, past yeah. that back. Yeah. Back on the, yep, there you go. Um, how often
often are you updating these third party apps? Oh, uh, a couple times a year, to okay. be honest. Yeah, like once in the fall and once in the, anytime labs are being provisioned. Um, so we'll provision a lab in the fall and then we'll redo it in, during the winter break. And uh, there are uh, uh, updates that they put out in between times, you just, you just grab it? Yeah, yeah, if there's an update uh, that comes out in between, um, yeah, we could rebuild the package and push it out, of course, especially if a professor's like, hey, I need that you know, Xcode update or whatever. Uh, well, that's a different story, but a third party app. Um, you know, if there is an update they want, you know, that's why we keep that, uh, that's why it's important to keep that bundle ID the same, right? So I don't want to have to reprovision, you know, a lab computer from scratch. I don't want to have to erase the disk in order to upgrade Cyberduck, right? So I've kept that bundle ID the same so I can push that package. Installer goes to push that package and says, okay, I already have a receipt for that bundle ID. So if there was anything that that changed about that app, Installer takes care of that for me. So it doesn't happen too often in our environment. Often professors aren't like, hey, Cyberduck went from 7.01 to 7.02, right? Uh, but if it were to, that bundle ID, keeping at the same uh, is key. And like I said, in our environment, once in the fall before we provision everything, and then over the winter, uh, we'll go ahead and erase install and uh, you know, re redo the labs from scratch. Just like I said, we only erase that uh, home, home profile and they're standard users, so in theory, they really shouldn't be able to do much um, other than is outside of their home folder. But you know, whatever, in the winter, we'll go ahead and erase install while nobody's around and start from scratch. Does your script do something that uh, auto package doesn't do? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think you could write an auto package recipe. I just haven't Googled how to do that, I guess. Okay. Yeah. The, the other reason for not updating that software too often, a lot of professors like to do screenshots and documentation. So then we go in there and, you know, change it all on them. And then they're like, what, where'd this monkey wrench come from? Right. Yeah, so, match. yeah, we, we do update web browsers, Firefox, Chrome. Um, you know, Safari, stuff like that, like periodically, typically within three releases of whatever the new one is, roll them out. Um, Adobe, you know, the same, like Adobe Reader, not the Creative Cloud Suite, but that's going to be interesting with how they roll out the updates and how you can postpone them for, to a certain degree. But the biggest problem we've run into that is, okay, I'm a student, I got a personal device, I got the same version it, theoretically of Adobe, but mine's newer than the lab, or the lab's newer than mine. I go to upgrade now, totally out of sync. Yeah, we've had students come in and say, hey, I'm running uh, Premiere 2019, and I'm trying to do my final in the homework lab, and you're on 2018, and it's like, oh. You know, so that, <laughs> that occasion. We have started to leverage the patch man management part of Jamf. Uh, I mean, I sort of look at it a little bit. To me, it just seems like a fancy way to do a policy that pushes a package, right? Yeah. But um, the, uh, you know, that, that we've started to get into that to help rolling, especially things with like web browsers. Yeah, right, right at the end of the row there. Uh, yeah. I was thinking about it. Um, but you said Pharos for your printing solution? Is that, is that what I'm saying? Yeah, we have Pharos Uniprint. Um, you put your printers in your in self service, um, lot printing, print management. All is that all coming from Pharos and the printer itself? I just for your solution, I'd love to hear how you guys are doing that. Yeah, so we have three Windows Server 2012 uh, print servers there. They have all the print queues. Uh, basically, it's broken up. One entire server is all the academic printers. The other server is all the administrative buildings and departmental printers. And the third one is basically like a test server. It also the database proxy for Pharos and some other licensing magic in the background um, to just isolate them off. They, the servers, have all the printer shares on them, all the permissions, the queue settings. Uh, if it's a color printer, whether Xerox or HP, there's two queues. There's a black and white queue, there's a color queue. It sets the charges accordingly. You send it to there, it prints off what you sent. Um, and we have different, you know, different security measures in a way on Macs. So you could still get around it and send a color print job to a black and white printer and only pay like the seven cents instead of whatever, it, like 20 cents or something it is. So there is still that loophole, but yeah. Yeah, in our environment, you probably could go change, you know, start your cups web interface, change the PPG file from not black and white to color, print to a black and white queue, and it'd probably come out in color. Uh, but you know, most people don't do that, so yeah. it works out. <laughs> Anyone else? 
Well, we didn't take up your whole 75 minutes, but I hope you guys enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>